Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato Sama sambud Homage to the Blessed One The Worthy One The Supremely Enlightened One Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu Namo Buddhaya. Fellow monks, meritorious lay disciples, today we have this very special opportunity to come together and listen to the instructions of a fully enlightened Buddha. Our great teacher, the Supreme Buddha, taught us many things that we wouldn't know otherwise. He taught us many things that go against uh, normal life, normal society. One of those things that he taught so much about is renunciation, nekkhamma. Do you know what renunciation is? What's renunciation? It means giving things up, right? Giving, giving up the right things. And that's why we need our great teacher, the Supreme Buddha, to help us know what, what the right things are to give up, right? So one of the things that, that the Supreme Buddha taught us that we need to give up are sensual pleasures. That sensual pleasures distort how we see the world, right? When we're, when we're very attached to, to sensual pleasures, we're not seeing things correctly. So now we're going to learn about, about this training that's involved with renunciation. And he gives a simile of an elephant. So, you know, elephants were, were very important in the time of the Buddha. Uh, maybe you see when people were building roads around here, they have big tractors, right? Things with scoops on the front. Well, they didn't have those. All they had was elephants to do that work. And they didn't have uh, tanks, you know, for, for battles. They just had elephants, right? And so these elephants, they had to be trained very well. You couldn't just take a wild elephant into a battle. Uh, you have to train it. And so the Blessed One gives us this simile of training an elephant. He says, suppose uh, a noble king uh, tells his elephant trainer, Okay, I need a new elephant. I need another elephant. Take my best elephant. Take an elephant that's already trained and go into the forest and find a new elephant. And when you find that elephant, take that elephant by the neck and tie it to this other elephant that's already trained. Tie it to this elephant that's already tamed. And so the elephant trainer says, yes, sir. And he takes the king's elephant, the king's royal elephant, and he goes into the forest. And he finds another elephant, and he, he follows the king's instructions. What does he do? He ties, it, uh, ties a rope around its neck and binds it to the king's elephant. And then he uses the king's trained elephant to pull the elephant out of the forest. So why do you need to... Why do you need to do it that way? Can't you just go into the elephant forest and find an elephant and say, Here, elephant, can you do it that way? No. No, why is that? Because you don't have anything that that elephant wants, right? That elephant wants to stay in the forest. He likes it in the forest. He's used to the forest. He enjoys everything about the forest, right? So the only way to bring him out is to get an, an even bigger elephant, an elephant that's very well tamed, and, and tie it to that, to that forest elephant and bring it out into the open, right? Because the, the forest elephant, he loves the forest. He only wants to live in the forest. So we use this, this trained elephant to pull him out of the elephant wood. So then the, the elephant trainer 
tells the king, okay, I have the elephant. I've pulled him out of the forest. Then the king tells him, okay, now you need to train him. Now you need to subdue him. Uh, he has many habits that he, that he did when he lived in the forest. We have, to, we have to get rid of those habits. So what does an elephant do in the forest? An elephant does anything it wants to do, right? That's because it's an elephant. It's huge. So it can, if it wants to go to a river, it sees a river, it just goes down to the river. If it wants to eat some leaves on the top of a tree, it just knocks down the tree, right? It does whatever it wants. It lies down wherever it wants. It walks wherever it wants. But you can't have that happening if you're going to bring an elephant uh, into the city, if you're going to bring the elephant into a battle, right? You have, to, you have to get rid of these habits that an elephant has to, of doing whatever it wants, enjoying whatever it wants to enjoy. So the king says, get rid of these, these habits that the elephant has, that it, that it does in the forest, and make him get used to the habits of human beings, the habits of people, the, the work that it's going to have to do. So having replied, yes, sire, the elephant tamer plants a large post in the earth and binds the forest elephant to it by the neck in order to subdue his forest habits and to inculcate in him habits congenial to human beings. So he has to take a very big post and bury it deep in the earth. A very strong post, and he can tie that elephant to this post. That's the only thing that can keep this wild elephant under control at the beginning. Then the next thing the elephant trainer does is he speaks to this elephant very sweetly, Right? He doesn't yell at the elephant. He doesn't hit him. He talks very soft words. He says very sweet things, very gentle words, to make this elephant feel comfortable. And so when the elephant is, has calmed down and starts to listen uh, to the elephant tamer, then he gives him uh, some food to eat. He gives him some grass to eat, some water to drink. And as soon as he sees that this elephant is, is going to eat, then the trainer is very happy. He thinks, okay, now we have him. He's not going to die. He can live. He can live with people right now. Next, the elephant trainer trains him to do things. So he says, uh, take this up, put this down, right? That's a big job that elephants have is to be able to lift things because they're very strong. So he says, pick this up, put this down. And when the elephant is willing to do those things, he gives him more instructions. He says, go forward, go backwards, right? So you see very slowly, uh, he's training this elephant, doing little bit by little bit to get the elephant tamed. He tells him, uh, get up sit down, right? All the things that an elephant has to be able to do. So when the king's elephant obeys his tamer's orders to get up and sit down and carries out his instructions, the elephant tamer trains him further in the task called imperturbability. So what's this task called? Imperturbability. Do you know what it means to be imperturbable? Imperturbable? Well, it's a good thing. It means that nothing can bother you, right? You're imperturbable. So if someone, uh, maybe they spill their lunch on your lap, right? You have your nice white clothes on and somebody spills a pot of curry on you. If you're imperturbable, what do you do? You say, oh, okay, can you get a rag? Right? You don't, oh, what happened to my clothes, right? That's not imperturbable. Imperturbable, nothing bothers you, right? People can say things. doesn't matter what they say. It doesn't bother you. You don't get upset. So now this elephant is going to be trained in the imperturbable. So nothing will upset this elephant. So the elephant trainer, he ties a, a big board to the trunk. 
So he pins the, the elephant's trunk down. Uh, and a man with a, a lance, a big long spear, uh, sits on his neck, sits on the elephant's neck. And men with lances in their hand uh, stand all around the elephant. And the elephant tamer stands in front holding a very long pole. Okay. And they, they go at the elephant, right? They try and poke him. And they're trying to make sure that the elephant doesn't get bothered by things because eventually they'll take the, the elephant into a battle and all sorts of things happen in a, in a battle. And they don't want that elephant to get scared, to get spooked. So when the elephant is being trained in the task of imperturbability, he does not move his forelegs or his hind legs. He does not move his forequarters or his hindquarters. He does not move his head, ears, tusks, tail, or trunk. So they try to get the elephant to stand very still. No matter, how much they, no matter how much they poke at him, they want the elephant to stand completely still. So this is called uh, being imperturbable. And then this king's elephant is able to endure uh, spears being thrown at him, uh, people hitting him, arrows being shot at him, right? He, uh, he's able to stand totally still there can be drums, all sorts of noise going on, but this elephant will be very steady. He won't lose control. So once, uh, once an elephant is, is trained like this, then he's worthy of the king. Then it's safe to put the king on him, right? The king could ride this elephant because the king is very important. You know, you only have one king usually. And you wouldn't want to put a king on an elephant that was going to roll over or run away as soon as he heard some noise, right? So that's why they train uh, this elephant in this very serious way. Now, did they start out by poking him with, with spears, hitting him with sticks, making lots of loud, terrible noises? Is that how his training started? No. How did his training start? With sweet words. Remember, the, the elephant trainer gave him very sweet words, and he gave him food to eat, right? Because the elephant trainer really does care about the elephant, right? But then, by the end of his training, he's able to endure anything. So this is, this is how an elephant is trained. So it's very amazing, isn't it, that the Supreme Buddha would know exactly how an elephant was trained. That... Uh, that he would know all these details. But when we think about the Supreme Buddha and we think about his qualities, do we think about him as a, as a great elephant trainer, as a great elephant tamer? No. He trained beings much more difficult to train than elephants, didn't he? He trained human beings, right? And devas, gods. Human beings are much harder to train than elephants, right? The process for elephants is very simple. For us human beings, it's very difficult. So now, now we get to learn how the Supreme Buddha trains human beings, trains people. So the Supreme Buddha says, So too, Akivesana, a Tathagata appears in the world, accomplished, fully enlightened, perfect in true knowledge and conduct, sublime, knower of worlds, incomparable leader of persons to be tamed, teacher of gods and humans, enlightened, blessed. He declares this world with its gods, its maras, and its brahmas, this generation with its recluses and brahmins, its princes and its people, which he himself has realized by direct knowledge. He teaches the Dhamma that is good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good in the end, with the right meaning and phrasing. And he reveals a holy life that is utterly perfect and pure. So this is our great teacher, the Supreme Buddha. He's the ultimate tra uh, trainer of people who want to be tamed. And he knows the holy life. He knows the complete way to overcome our defilements and put an end to this long round of samsara. 
So when the Tathagata arises, someone hears this news, and he goes and he listens to the Tathagata. When he listens to the Tathagata's Dhamma, he develops confidence in the Supreme Buddha. When he develops confidence in the Supreme Buddha, he thinks, you know, these instructions, they're very hard to follow when you live at home, when you live in a house. Why don't I become a monk? Why don't I shave off my hair and beard, put on yellow robes, and go from, from the home life into homelessness? So, having made this decision at some later time, he does just that. He shaves off his hair and beard, he puts on a yellow robe, and he goes forth from the house life into homelessness. He may abandon uh, a large fortune, a lot of money, or just a little money. He may be rich or poor, but he gives it all up. He may have a, a small family or a large family, but he gives it all up. So the Supreme Buddha says, this is the way that a human being uh, comes out into the open. Remember the, the elephant? How the elephant came out into the open? He was tied to a, to a trained elephant and pulled out into the open, away from the elephant forest. So this is the way that a human being comes out into the open. They go forth from the, the house life into homelessness. So what was it that, that the elephant clung to? It was the forest. He liked living in the forest. But what is it that people cling to? Sensual pleasures, exactly. And so the, the Supreme Buddha teaches a way for overcoming this, this clinging to sensual pleasures. So then the Tathagata disciplines him further. He says, Come, bhikkhu, be virtuous, restrained with the restraint of the patimokkha. Be perfect in conduct and resort, and seeing fear in the slightest fault, train by undertaking the training precepts. So the Supreme Buddha has laid down uh, these rules for his disciples for the monks and nuns, he laid down what's called the patimokkha. So these are all the instructions that, that the monks and the nuns follow. And the Supreme Buddha says, follow these instructions. Follow them very carefully. Be afraid of, of even breaking one of these precepts just a little bit. So you know the, the five precepts that you follow all the time, and you know the eight precepts that uh, that you follow here when you come to the to the poya day, right? So the Supreme Buddha gave down, uh, laid down extra precepts, many extra precepts, for his monks and his nuns. Especially he, so when Agivesana, the noble disciple, is virtuous, and seeing fear in the slightest fault, trains by undertaking the training precepts. Then the Tathagata disciplines him further. Come, bhikkhu. Guard the doors of your sense faculties. So do you know what your sense faculties are? Do you remember what your sense faculties are? First, first sense faculty? Eyes. Ear. Nose. Tongue. Mm -hmm. Body. And mind. Yeah. So the Supreme Buddha says, Come, Bhikkhu, guard the doors of your sense faculties. On seeing a form with the eye, do not grasp at its signs and features. So, signs and features, do you know what signs and features are? They're the characteristics of things, right? So, these flowers uh, here, what are some of their signs? They're yellow, yeah. And then the shape, they're not, they're not too big, not too small, they have a brown center. So, those are the signs and features, right? So, the Supreme Buddha says, don't grasp at those signs and features. That when you see something beautiful with your eyes, don't, uh, don't become fixated on all the beautiful qualities. So nowadays when people try and sell things, they want to make them as beautiful as possible, right? As shiny as possible, as flashy as possible. That's because they know that our eyes are hungry for, for beautiful things, right? 
when we see something beautiful, we just want to look at it more and more. Right? When we see a, a beautiful car, a beautiful person, a beautiful house, we like to just keep looking at it, right? We study it. We look at all, the, uh, all of its qualities. The Supreme Buddha says, be careful. That's where the problem starts. That's where you have to watch out. Because you start to, to look at all those beautiful aspects, and then you become attached to it. He says, since if you were to leave the eye faculty unguarded, evil, unwholesome states of covetousness and grief might invade you. Practice the way of its restraint. So the more you look at the, the beautiful objects, the more you want to have them, right? When you see beautiful things that other people have, you want to have them for yourself. Right? You try and figure out a way that you can get it, either by, uh, in a good way or a bad way, right? That desire comes up. So in the same way, the Supreme Buddha says, when you hear a sound with your ears, don't grasp at the, at the signs and features. Don't become attached to, the, to those beautiful aspects about it. When you smell something with the nose, don't get obsessed with, with all those uh, wonderful smells. When you taste something with, with the tongue, don't grasp at the characteristics of the taste. Right? Because if you do, then you become attached. Uh, then you become attached to it, and you might start to have uh, bad thoughts in your mind, greed, trying to get more of whatever it is. And the same with the body, the same with the mind, that when, when you have these, uh, these external objects, if you pay very close attention to all of the, the beautiful aspects of them, all we, all we want is more. So this is the next training having restraint with the, with the six faculties. Then the Supreme Buddha says, when Akivesana, the noble disciple, guards the doors of his sense faculties, then the Tathagata disciplines him further. He says, come bhikkhu, be moderate in eating. Reflecting wisely, you should take food neither for amusement nor for intoxication nor for the sake of physical beauty and attractiveness, but only for the endurance and continuous continuance of this body, for ending discomfort and for assisting the holy life. So this is what uh, you hear the monks chant uh, every day before we eat our meal. And today, uh, on the Poya Day, we all chanted that together, remember? So this is, this is the way the Supreme Buddha taught us to to think about our food, right? Because there are many sensual pleasures that you can give up completely, right? Beautiful houses, beautiful cars, beautiful people. You can give those up just fine. It doesn't hurt you. But can you give up food completely? Can you stop eating food? Not for very long. Not for very long. The Supreme Buddha tried to give up food, right? But he knows that that, that doesn't work, right? So we have to eat food. We can't avoid that. So the Supreme Buddha gives very special instructions. He says you have to have a healthy relationship with this food. You have to eat this food to keep your body healthy, not to make your body beautiful, not to, not to enjoy delicious tastes, but so you can lead this holy life. If you have hunger, it's hard to meditate, right? Have you ever tried to meditate when you were really hungry? What do you think about? Food. You think about the refrigerator, right? Not whatever it is you're trying to pay attention to. So the Supreme Buddha knew that it's hard. It's hard to practice when you're very hungry. So you have to eat. But when you do, you have to eat in a way that just gets rid of your hunger. Right? So you're paying attention. How much food do I really need? How much do I need to eat? And so he says, you should think, uh, in this way, I will terminate old feelings without arousing new feelings. So I will terminate old feelings without arousing new feelings. What kind of feelings do you think we're terminating? What kind of feelings are we ending by eating? Hunger. Yeah. And what kind of new feelings are we, do we not want to have arise? Greed. 
right? So that's the balance. You have to eat enough so you get rid of the old feelings of hunger, but not to eat so much that you get new feelings of greed, or maybe even feelings of mm, being too full, right? Have you ever tried to meditate when you ate too much food? It's not very easy to do, right? You fall asleep. So the Supreme Buddha taught us, we need, to, we need to be very careful with food. We need to eat food for the right reason, not just for enjoyment. So then the Supreme Buddha gives the next, the next training. He says, come bhikkhu, be devoted to wakefulness. So devoted to what? Wakefulness. Okay. He says, during the day, while walking back and forth and sitting, purify your mind of obstructive states. So during the day, when you're sitting in meditation, when you're walking back and forth in meditation, what's your job? What are you trying to do? You're trying to get rid of unwholesome mental states. Purify your mind of obstructive states. Do you know what an obstructive state is? An obstructive state? What does it mean to obstruct something? Yeah, to block, exactly. So if we, have, uh, if we have thoughts in our mind that block things, what kind of thoughts might block wholesome qualities? Maybe greedy thoughts, right? Or angry thoughts, yeah. If we have, if we have a really angry mind, can we concentrate ourselves? No. If we have greed in our mind, can we concentrate on the breath or something very subtle? The Supreme Buddha says, during the day while walking back and forth and sitting, purify your mind of obstructive states. Then in the first part of the night, while walking back and forth and sitting, purify your mind of obstructive states. So this is what the Supreme Buddha calls uh, being devoted to wakefulness. It's not just being awake. Right? It doesn't mean that you just drink a, lot of, uh, drink a lot of coffee, drink a lot of tea, and then you're wakeful. Right? It doesn't work that way. You have to constantly be looking at your mind, trying to remove unwholesome, uh, unwholesome states in your mind. Then in the middle watch of the night, you should lie down on the right side in the lion's pose, with one foot overlapping the other, mindful and fully aware. Uh, noting the time in your mind for rising. So, uh, even in falling asleep, the Supreme Buddha says, be aware, right? Lay down very carefully and think about the time that you should wake up. And then when you get up in the last watch of the night, while walking back and forth and sitting, again, purify your mind of obstructive states. So this is what the Supreme Buddha wants us to be doing all day long is looking at our mind and trying to remove those states, uh, those thoughts in our mind that would keep us from developing wholesome qualities. So then the next, the next training, the Supreme Buddha says, when Akivesana, the noble disciple, is devoted to wakefulness, the Tathagata disciplines him further. Come, bhikkhu, be possessed of mindfulness and full awareness, so sati sampajanyu. Act in full awareness when going forward and returning, when looking ahead and looking away, when flexing and extending your limbs. So remember how the elephant was trained? The elephant was trained, pick up, put down, come forward, go back. Right? So when the Supreme Buddha trains his disciples, he says, when you're doing these, these actions with your body, you need to have full awareness. You need to be mindful. You need to think about what it is that you're doing. When wearing your robes and carrying your outer robe and bowl, when eating, drinking, consuming food and tasting, when defecating and urinating. So isn't this amazing? The Supreme Buddha even tells us that we need to pay very careful attention when we're using the, when we're going to the bathroom, right? We can, we can think, you know, this is the nature of this body. We come into a, into a secret room to do these things. Maybe we can pretend that the, that the body doesn't need to do these things, right? 
But actually, it does. This is the nature of the body. We have to use the bathroom a few times a day, right? And so when we, when we look at the body wisely, you know, we don't become so attached to it. We think, yeah, this body, it has some drawbacks. It has some problems. When walking, standing, sitting, falling asleep, waking up, talking, and keeping silent. So in all the things that we do, to have mindfulness and full awareness, to be aware of the things that we're doing, not just to act uh, in any sort of way. So do you remember all the things that, that have been part of this training? Remember what happens first? The disciple hears the, the Blessed One's teachings, right? He thinks, it's hard to lead this life when I'm living at home, right? It's hard to, to do all these instructions when you have a house, when you have a job, responsibilities like that. So he, he knows he has to become a monk. He has to go, uh, go into the monk life. And do you remember what's next? The Supreme Buddha gives him the patimokkha, the training precepts, to be afraid of, of breaking even very small rules. Then, do you remember what's next? After the patimokkha? Restraint of the sense faculties, right? Guarding the eye, guarding the ear, the nose, tongue, body and mind. Not grasping and not being attached to the, to the beautiful aspects of things. Then next, how does he train? With food. Remember moderation in food. Only eating enough uh, to end the hunger, right? To keep the body healthy. Not overindulging in food. And then, do you remember what's next? Wakefulness, right? Spending the day uh, removing bad thoughts from the mind cultivating wholesome thoughts. And then, sati sampajanya, mindfulness and clear comprehension in all, in all the things that we do with our body. So then, when the noble disciple possesses mindfulness and full awareness, then the Tathagata disciplines him further. Come, bhikkhu, resort to a secluded resting place, the forest, the root of a tree, a mountain, a ravine, a hillside cave, a charnel ground, a jungle thicket, an open space, a heap of straw. So now the Supreme Buddha says, you need to go to a quiet place, right? So is this the, is this the first thing that, that the Supreme Buddha does? He says, okay, you've, we've sh you've shaved off your hair, you've got the right clothes on, now go live by yourself. Go live alone somewhere. Does he say that? No. Remember, just like the elephant trainer, he didn't start poking the, the elephant with, with sticks and spears and things right away. He started very slowly, very gradually. This is what's so beautiful about our great teacher's instruction, is that he understands how people are. He understands uh, the mind of someone who's not tamed. And he knows that it takes a gradual instruction. And only after, uh, only after good training is someone able to to endure these, these quiet places, right? Because what happens if we go somewhere quiet, but our mind isn't, isn't tamed? What do we think about? Home, right? We think about all the sensual pleasures that we've, been, that we've left behind. And then it doesn't do us any good to be out in the forest, to be on the top of a mountain. Because even though our body is on the top of a mountain, Where's our mind? It's back in the refrigerator, right? So the Supreme Buddha, he knows how to train people. So this monk, he goes to a secluded place, the forest, a heap of straw. On returning from his alms round, after his meal, he sits down, folding his legs crosswise, setting his body upright, and establishing mindfulness in front of him. Abandoning covetousness for the world, he abides with a mind free from covetousness. 
he purifies his mind from covetousness. So what is this covetousness? It's greed, having greed for things, sensual desire. So this is the first thing that he overcomes. Abandoning ill will and hatred, he abides with a mind free from ill will, compassionate for the welfare of all beings. So this is the second hindrance that he overcomes. He, he removes all the ill will, all the hatred that he has in his mind. He doesn't think about bad things that people have done to him. He wants everyone to be happy. He has compassion for everyone. Abandoning sloth and torpor, he abides free from sloth and torpor, percipient of light, mindful and fully aware. So he's not tired. Remember, because he got that good instruction in, in eating food, right? So we know that he didn't, he didn't eat too much food when he went on his alms round. So he's not going to be sleepy, right? He knows that, that sleeping during meditation doesn't help him at all, right? And he knows how to, how to wake himself up, how to make his mind very bright. Abandoning doubt, he abides having gone beyond doubt, unperplexed about wholesome states. He purifies his mind from doubt. So he has complete confidence in the teaching of the Supreme Buddha. He knows that this, this long training that he's, been, uh, that he's been doing is beneficial. Right? He can, now he can see the results starting to happen. He can see how he's able to make his mind very peaceful because he's followed all of these instructions. <clears throat> Having thus abandoned these five hindrances, imperfections of the mind that weaken wisdom, he abides contemplating the body as a body, ardent, fully aware and mindful, having put away covetousness and grief for the world. So now, he practices the, the foundations of mindfulness. Uh, he abides contemplating feelings as feelings, mind as mind, mind objects as mind objects, ardent, fully aware and mindful, having put away covetousness and grief for the world. So in this way, he's abandoning all of his desire for things in the world, right? He's practicing this, this renunciation. Because remember, why was it that, that, uh, that Prince Jayasena wasn't able to, to understand the Dhamma? Right. He wasn't living a life of renunciation. He was attached to sensual pleasures. <coughs> the Supreme Buddha says, Just as, Agivesana, the elephant tamer plants a large post in the earth and binds the forest elephant to it by the neck, in order to subdue his forest habits and to instill in him habits that are friendly to human beings. So these four foundations of mindfulness are the bindings for the mind of the noble disciple in order to subdue his habits based on the household life, to subdue his memories and intentions based on the household life, to subdue his distress fatigue and fever based on the household life, and in order that he may attain the true way and realize Nibbana. So remember, this elephant, when it was being trained, it had to be tied to something very strong, to a post that was buried deep into the earth, right? Because elephants, they're big. Uh, they can break things just accidentally, right? If, if you tie them with a rope that's not very strong, they just shift their body and, and the rope breaks, right? So in order to tame an elephant, you have to tie it to a post that's very strong, that's buried very deep in the earth. And the Supreme Buddha says, for human beings, what's this post? What's this post that he uses that's very strong to tame human beings? The four foundations of mindfulness, right? The Supreme Buddha says, this is a safe place to keep your mind, that this, <clears throat> this is a safe area for your mind to live in, these four foundations of mindfulness. When you're mindful of the body, mindful of thoughts, uh, mindful of the mind, mindful of mental objects. And that in this way, the noble disciple is able to subdue 
all those desires that he or she has for the household life, right? Because if you simply uh, put on robes, shave your, shave your head, right, and go sit somewhere by yourself, the mind can think about many, many things that have to do with the household life. Think about your family, think about uh, school, sports, all sorts of things, right? If you don't have a proper thing to think about, if you don't have a proper uh, grounding. So the Supreme Buddha says, these four foundations of mindfulness, these are steady, these are stable, these are something that we can bind our mind to, to, to overcome all the desire that we have for sensual pleasures. So to subdue his distress, fatigue, and fever based on the household life, and in order that he may attain the true way and realize Nibbana. Then the Tathagata disciplines him further. Come, Bhikkhu, abide contemplating the body as a body, but do not think thoughts of sensual desire. Abide contemplating feelings as feelings, mind as mind, mind objects as mind objects, but do not think thoughts of sensual desire. So in this way, the monk is able to attain a very deep state of concentration. Then, with the stilling of applied and sustained thought, he enters upon and abides in the second jhana. He attains the third jhana and the fourth jhana. So, remember the Prince Jayasena, he was trying to understand concentration. Now, had Prince Jayasena done any of these training things? Was he following the Patimokha? You know, did he have instruction about, about how to eat food, about how to, how to move his body, right? how, to gar- how to guard his senses? No, he didn't have any of those instructions. He didn't know how any of those things worked. So it wasn't possible for him to even imagine this, this type of concentration that's so very deep, that allows someone to, to penetrate the nature of reality. So when this noble disciple's mind is thus concentrated and purified, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfection, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability. Do you remember that word? Imperturbability? Right? That was what, that was what the elephant trainer was trying to get this elephant to have. That no matter what would happen to the elephant, he would stand firm. He would stand without moving. So in the same way, this monk who's developed this concentration, his mind is very pure, it's very clear, it's very bright, it doesn't have any, doesn't have any problems in it, no unwholesome thoughts. It's malleable. He can do whatever he wants with his mind. He can direct it in any way that he wants. He can do whatever he wants with it. It's steady and attained to imperturbability. So any thoughts uh, that arise, he knows how to, how to put those, those thoughts away. And he uses this, uh, this very special mind, and he directs it to the knowledge, directs it to the knowledge of the recollection of past lives. He recollects his manifold past lives, so he remembers his previous births, one birth, two births, three births, 10 births, 20, a hundred, a thousand, a hundred thousand, right? Can you remember what you did last week on Sunday? How about what you did last year, a year ago today? Can you remember that? I can't remember that, right? Can you remember five years ago? No. Why is that? Because we don't have this mind developed, right? But this noble disciple, his mind is very pure, very sharp, very developed. So not only can he recollect the life that he lived then, but previous lives as well. And not just one or two, but many, many hundreds of thousands, eons and eons of lives he can remember. And not only can he remember that he had these lives, but he can remember what his name was, what his family was like, the kind of food that he ate, the things that he did, the way that he talked. 
he can remember all the aspects of each of these lives. It's hard to imagine, isn't it? We can believe it because we have confidence in the, in the teaching of the Supreme Buddha, but when our mind isn't purified like that, it's hard to imagine being able to remember all those lives. So this is the first, uh, this is the first knowledge that he gains. Then when his concentrated mind is purified, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfection, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, he directs it to the knowledge of the passing away and reappearance of beings. So what was the first knowledge? His own lives, right? All his previous, his lives. And what's this knowledge? the arising and the passing away of other beings. Right? So with the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses the human, he sees beings passing away and reappearing, inferior and superior, fair and ugly, fortunate and unfortunate. So beings that have, uh, that have very, a lot of money, beings that are very poor, right? beings that are very healthy, beings that are very ill. So all sorts of different kinds of beings. And he understands how it is that beings uh, arise and pass on this way. He understands the good actions that someone does to be reborn in a good destination. He understands the bad actions that people did, that they're born in a bad destination. He thinks, these worthy beings who were ill-conducted in body, speech, and mind, so they did bad things with their body, their speech, and their mind. Revilers of noble ones, so they weren't respectful to wise people, to monks and nuns. Wrong in their views, giving effect to wrong views in their actions, so because they held wrong views, they did bad things with their body, with their speech, and with their mind. On the dissolution of the body after death, have reappeared in a state of deprivation, in a bad destination, in perdition, even in hell. So he understands the bad actions that people do and that that leads them to a bad destination, right? The ghost world, animal realm, the hell realms. But he sees other people, uh, these worthy beings who were well conducted in body, speech, and mind. They did good things with their body good things with their speech, good things with their mind. So what are, the, what are good things that people do with their body? What are the precepts that you keep with your body? Yeah, abstaining from killing, so these people don't kill, they don't steal, they don't commit sexual misconduct, right? They do good things with their speech. How can they do good things with their speech? They don't tell lies, they don't gossip, they don't use harsh speech. They don't use their words to, to break apart friendships. Right? And they do good things with their mind. They don't think greedy thoughts. They don't think hateful thoughts. They have right view. And because of that right view, they do good things with their body, speech, and mind. And those people, he sees that they're born in a good destination, either in the human realm or in a heavenly realm. So using this divine eye that's not like the ordinary eye. So with, do you know about these, these different kinds of eyes? What kind of eyes do we have? We just have ordinary eyes, right? Can we see those things with our ordinary eyes? No. How about if we look a long time? Really hard? No. No, no matter how hard you look with your ordinary eyes, you're not going to be able to see these things. It's only with, with this special eye, this divine eye, that's, that's developed through this training, through this practice, that someone is able to see how beings uh, pass away and arise because of their actions. So this is the, uh, this is the second knowledge that this person gained. So when his concentrated mind is thus purified, bright, unblemished, 
rid of imperfection, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability. He directs it to the knowledge of the destruction of the taints. He understands as it actually is. This is suffering. He understands as it actually is. This is the origin of suffering. He understands as it actually is. This is the cessation of suffering. He understands as it actually is. This is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. So what is, what is he doing here? He's understanding the Four Noble Truths. Right? He understands as it actually is. These are the taints. He understands as it actually is. This is the origin of the taints. He understands as it actually is. This is the cessation of the taints. He understands as it actually is. This is the way leading to the cessation of the taints. When he knows and sees thus, his mind is liberated from the taint of sensual desire, from the taint of being, and from the taint of ignorance. So he's abandoned all the, all the craving that he would have had. Remember this problem that, that Prince Jayasena had with his craving for sensual desire? So this noble disciple has overcome the taint of, of sensual desire, the taint of being, the taint of ignorance. When it is liberated, there comes the knowledge. It is liberated. He understands. Birth is destroyed. The holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is no more coming to any state of being. So now when we hear someone talk about the holy life, we know exactly what it is that they mean. Because we've heard today this whole, the whole process that the Buddha has for someone to tame their mind, starting with hearing the Dhamma, establishing confidence in the Dhamma, shaving off uh, hair, putting on the robes. This whole process, following the Patimokkha, all these things. Now we know. We know why Prince Jayasena couldn't possibly understand <coughs> how, to, how to achieve this, this kind of concentration. The Supreme Buddha says, that bhikkhu is able to endure cold and heat, hunger and thirst, contact with gadflies, mosquitoes, wind, the sun, and creeping things. He is able to endure ill-spoken, unwelcome words and arisen bodily feelings that are painful, racking, sharp, piercing, disagreeable, distressing, and menacing to life. So, does anything bother this bhikkhu? No. The natural things in the world, heat, cold, flies, those things don't bother him at all. Right? If people, people say mean things to him, does it bother him? No. This is the incredible power of this, of this training. Even if he has painful feelings in his body, they don't disturb his mind. being rid of all lust, hate, and delusion, purged of flaws. He is worthy of gifts, worthy of hospitality, worthy of offerings, worthy of reverential salutations, an unsurpassed field of merit for the world. Then the Blessed One says, Agivesana, if a king has an elephant and it dies when it's very old, but it, hasn't been, but it hasn't been trained, it hasn't been tamed, then people think of it just as an old elephant, just as a worthless elephant that hasn't been tamed. Even if it lives a very long time, it's still just an ordinary elephant. Right? He says if the king's elephant uh, lives till middle age and then dies, but he hasn't been trained, then still he's just an ordinary elephant. It doesn't matter how long he lived. He's still just an ordinary elephant if he hasn't undergone training. If the elephant dies when it's very young, but it hasn't been trained, people still know it just as an ordinary elephant that hasn't been trained. The Supreme Buddha says in the same way, if an elder bhikkhu, if an old monk, 
dies with his taints undestroyed, so he hasn't overcome the taint of sensual desire, the taint of being, the taint of ignorance. Even though he's a very old monk, if he hasn't overcome these taints, then people just know that he's an old monk, right? He didn't accomplish what he was supposed to accomplish. If he dies in his middle age and he hasn't overcome the taints, then he's just a middle-aged monk who died without having achieved the Supreme Buddha's goal, without having attained Nibbana. And the same with a newly ordained bhikkhu. If a bhikkhu ordains, if a bhikkhu dies shortly after he ordains, but he hasn't removed the taints, then people just know him as an ordinary bhikkhu that died. But the Supreme Buddha says, if the king's elephant dies when it's very old, having been trained well, then people know that elephant, it was well trained. He was a, he was a, a noble elephant, a good elephant for the king. The same if an elephant dies in its middle age, so not, not very old, not very young, but it's been tamed, then people know it's a tamed elephant that died. Even if that elephant dies when it's very, very young, if it received good training, then people know this was an elephant that was tamed. The Supreme Buddha says it's the same for bhikkhus, that it's the taming that matters, it's the training, it's achieving the goal of this holy life that matters. So if a monk dies when he's very old, if he dies in middle age, even if he dies when he's young, as long as that monk or nun has achieved the goal of the Blessed One's teaching, has tamed himself, has overcome these taints, overcome this sensual desire, then people know him as a monk who's achieved the Blessed One's teaching, who's attained this Nibbana, and who's put an end to this long round of samsara. So that is what the Blessed One said. The novice Achiravata was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Sad, sad, sad. So, because of not knowing about this uh, excellent holy life, about this training that the Supreme Buddha laid down, we have been born again and again in many bad destinations. So may we keep this training in mind. May we keep this teaching close to our hearts. May we remember the similes that we learned, the training of the elephant and the training of the bhikkhu. May we reflect on these teachings wisely. May we put them into practice. And through the power of this merit, may we one day realize the Four Noble Truths in this Gautama Buddha's dispensation. Sad, sad. Sadhu Namo Buddhaya Namo Buddhaya